Did anyone read the Edmonton Journal yesterday? Great long article about the discoverer of surfactant. Uh, she died um, a few days ago. American who worked um, in Boston and also in Montreal. So an interesting article. If you get hold of a copy of yesterday's uh, journal somehow, um, have a look and um, and read about her. She took, they talk about um, how she discovered surfactant and um, and put two and two together with uh, infant respiratory dis distress syndrome. So um, relevant to what we what we were talking about. Uh, right. Okay. So the last class on respiration, and uh, Wednesday we're on to what, kidney, and so we, as I said, we're going to talk about the res respiratory control. And um, there are two uh, main uh, classes of respiratory control. There's a uh, neural control. Um, you have uh, centers in the brain, in the brain stem actually, at the back here, which um, um, are, 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 which control um, the rhythm of respiration. And there are also some reflexes, as I'll show you, also out of the periphery, which uh, uh, come under the, um, the category of neural control. And then we have um, a whole other set of controls uh, at the chemical level, um, because we have uh, peripherally in the uh, uh, circulation um, chemoreceptors, which uh, monitor um, CO2 and oxygen levels. And because of the uh, connection between CO2 and pH, they also monitor pH. So, classical physiology here, multiple control mechanisms over a, a very, very important um, uh, physiological phenomenon, respiration. Multiple control mechanisms, and by multiple control mechanisms, you get um, a steady uh, response, homeostasis. So let's have a look at these different forms of, uh, rest of control. We'll start off with the uh, neural control, with the brain centers. Um, so the normal, quiet, as you're doing now, rhythmic, uh, rhythmic ventilation, inspiration and expiration, which you don't think about, is um, spontaneous. In other words, spontaneous respiration is completely dependent on the rhythmic discharge of neurons in the so-called respiratory centers in the brain. And um, as you know, you can partially override these by voluntary control. You can hold your breath uh, for a period of time. I'll talk a little bit about breath holding later. And also, uh, as I'm speaking, uh, my respiratory rhythm is being modified in order to um, take into account um, vocalization. So you can partially override this by voluntary control. Um, the inspiratory neurons, which you remember are the active ones, fire rhythmically, and they're controlled by something called a respiratory rhythm generator. And uh, the neural rhythm controls uh, inspiratory and expiratory muscles um, rhythmically, like this. Now, there are some physiologists out there, neurophysiologists, who love rhythm generators. Uh, and there are, we have a number of different rhythm generators. There are, there, there are neurons and neuronal systems which oscillate spontaneously. So these ones in the respiratory system oscillate spontaneously, uh, called rhythm generators or oscillators. There's another one when you walk, when you walk, there's a rhythm generator which is controlling one foot and then the other foot moving forward. And as I said, there are, there are physiologists that really get off on this. And we have a number of them in physiology upstairs who love rhythm generators. So this is uh, because basically we have no idea how they work. Don't let them hear me say that, but we don't really have a clue. Um, so they, uh, so they, you know, they find a fertile ground for, for investigation. And, um, and so here, this is, what, this is what we're talking about with the uh, neural centers. 
And um, so we're in this region of the brain here called the brain stem, uh, which can put in, and the parts that we're really interested in are this region here called the pons, and this region down here called the medulla, sometimes called the medulla oblongata, um, but generally um, uh, just abbreviated to the medulla. And so there are these regions in the pons and the medulla which control the rhythm of uh, breathing. So any injury which affects the brainstem region is going to affect respiration. So that's you know bad news. Brainstem injuries are generally bad news for that for that reason. Now things have changed here in the last uh, ten years or so. Prior to that. These diagrams here had um, these uh, centers in the pons, called the pons respiratory centers, the ones in pink on the diagram, and they had the medullary uh, respiratory centers, these two here in uh, blue, and that was all, uh, that, that was all they, had. We, they had. And the ones in pink up here in the pons were called the, uh, the neuro, pneumotaxic center, that's okay, pneumo, um, breathing, taxic, movement. So this is the movements associated with breathing um, um, center. And the apneustic center here. What is apneustic? What are words beginning with A uh, denote? No. Uh, no, or like no or not, yes. So the apneustic center would be a, a center where if you destroyed it, the um, um, breathing stops. Uh, and then in the, um, in the medulla, there are these two reason, re regions, the dorsal respiratory group, this one, and the ventral respiratory group. Remember anatomy uh, on us? Uh, dorsal is this side, and ventral is this side. So the dorsal respiratory group is on uh, closest to the back of your neck, and the ventral respiratory group here is closer to the front of the neck. So these two regions here. And up until about 10 years ago, that was it. Still didn't have any idea how they worked, but these, this, these were the regions considered to be important in um, generating and maintaining respiratory rhythm. Then, about 10 years ago or so, a group of neurophysiologists uh, discovered that there's another region uh, just in front of the ventral respiratory group here, called the pre-Botzinger complex. Uh, so in recent years, the pre-Botzinger complex has become the main center of attention in research on respiratory rhythm generation, and it's no longer clear how some of these other regions are involved. They are supportive, and they, um, they help uh, the generation and the maintenance of rhythm, but they are not the heart of the respiratory rhythm generation. Now, I, I, I can't remember, did, did, did Dr. Greer teach you about, uh, no, a, a neuro, neuro, no, okay, he taught in another class. The reason I ask is that um, we have two or three neuroscientists up in physiology, three actually, who all work on respiratory uh, rhythms and networks. And, um, uh, one of them in particular, Dr. Uh, Balani, who I don't think you've come across yet, but you probably will uh, if you stay in physiology. Uh, Dr. Balani was, um, was instrumental in the development of this idea that this group of neurons here is important in the respiratory rhythm. And he still works, and he works here, and he does terrific work on, the, on respiratory rhythms. And um, you know, about 10 years ago, he and a group of his, a group of other scientists were at a conference in Germany. And um, after the meeting, they sat down, had a beer, and uh, discussed this whole idea of this group of neurons uh, being the seat of the uh, oscillatory rhythm for respiration. And they all agreed, yes, you know, this is what it is, and we have to revise the way we previously thought. And then they said, well, well what should we call it? And, um, you know, there was a whole bunch of them, half a dozen scientists maybe, and um, none of them were called Botzinger. 
Um, and so I, I didn't even know how, how, what to call it. So they were drinking Botzinger beer, which is a very <laughs> popular German beer. Um, and so they said, let's call it the Botzinger Complex, because they were also talking about another region called the Botzinger Complex. And then they said, OK, so there's this other region here, which is in front of it, called the Pre-Botzinger region. Uh, let's call it the Pre-Botzinger Complex. And so that's what it's named after in German beer. <laughs> so I like to I like to help you with the names um, uh, like at pneumotaxic and at music, but I can't do anything about Botzinger. It's the name of the beer. You just got to remember it. Um, so that's the story of the pre-Botzinger complex. And now all of the respiratory physiologists are working on the pre-Botzinger complex, so including uh, Dr. Balani, who up, upstairs. Um, who's very active in this area. So, this is what, uh, this is what it's all about. Uh, it turns out that the medulla alone, this region here, can generate the basic respiratory rhythm. It's initiated in the cells of this special region called the pre complex, which discharge rhythmically. And it's called the respiratory rhythm generator. And these other groups, the dorsal uh, and ventral respiratory groups, and pneumotaxic and apneustic centers, the pink ones and the blue ones down here, all modify the rhythm, but they're not essential for the generation of the rhythm. So if you knock these other ones out, but you leave the pre bossinger complex, you still get a rhythm, but it's not as regular, and it's not the right depth, it's not the right frequency, but it's a rhythm. And so uh, that's where it uh, originates, and these other areas uh, modify it. So uh, this is what the firing of the inspiratory neurons looks like during uh, quiet respiration. Um, so there are bursts of activity 12 to 15 times a minute, quite spontaneously. No idea how this works. They fire spontaneously 12 to 15 times a minute. <coughs> Um, so here they are, frequency of action potentials, inspiration, increases gradually over here. I can see that it increases, uh, the frequency increases uh, here and then stops. And then there's no activity in the inspiratory neurons and then, uh, then they fire and they stop. So uh, spontaneously uh, rhythmic and the motor neurons, the expiratory muscles are inhibited when the inspiratory muscles are active. So what, so what that says is that when the inspiratory neurons fire, the expiratory neurons are inhibited. And when you're actively breathing, so that means you're now working the uh, expiratory neurons and muscles as well, then when the inspiratory are active, the inspiratory are, uh, are, are suppressed. And then, when the expiratory are active, the inspiratory suppresses. It's called reciprocal innovation, um, and it maintains it maintains uh, the rhythm of respiration. So, is that uh, is that okay? That's all I want to say about the pre-bossing the complex, really. Um, um, but you know, if you go carry on and do some more physiology, it's going to come back, and you're going to hear about it because it's an interesting region of spontaneous oscillation of nerve activity, which is of interest. Any, any questions on, uh, on, on that? The neural centers of um, respiratory rhythm. So um, in addition to that, or superimposed on that, there are stretch receptors in the lungs. So when you breathe in, there are stretch receptors here which start to fire, and they say, okay, okay, enough already, I'm inflated, you can stop now, and you stop. So there's feedback, feedback from the lungs on the state of expansion of the lungs, um, which superimposes on the rhythm. So uh, the stretch receptors are in the airway smooth muscle, and they're activated by inflation of the lungs, and they inhibit the inspiratory neurons. So you breathe in, and then you get feedback here saying, okay, enough already, and you 
uh, and it suppresses the inspiratory neurons. It's called the herring Brewer reflex. And it helps to set the respiratory rhythm, and again, like those other regions in the brain, reinforces the rhythmic activity of the brain centers that are generating the uh, oscillations. Uh, not Michael, if, uh, if you cut the vagus nerve on, on an experimental animal, then uh, respiration will still continue rhythmically. Remember, the basic rhythm is in the brain. Uh, it's just uh, slower and not as regular. So again, this is multiple inputs to maintain a really regular, smooth uh, rhythm homeostasis. So those are the, um, the, um, the main neural control centers, and they work together with these chemical um, control centers. So we also have regions containing chemosensitive cells centrally. We have chemosensitive cells centrally in the brain and also peripherally and in the circulation. And these cells are able to sense pH and the levels of dissolved oxygen and carbon dioxide. And of course, the, the, the dissolved carbon dioxide is related to pH. Don't, it doesn't sense oxygen bound to hemoglobin. Again, dissolved oxygen, so it, it, they sense the PO2. The central receptors are located in the respiratory center, so close to where we talked about before, and they respond to increases in CO2, probably by monitoring the pH of the CSF. Do you remember CSF? Cerebrospinal fluid. And the, and the interesting thing about the cerebrospinal fluid is that it doesn't have any buffers. So our blood, and your We'll talk about this again. This comes to acid base balance um, and uh, Dr. Alexander. Uh, the blood has buffers in it. Buffers are designed, remember your chemistry, buffers are designed to prevent wild flux changes in pH. They maintain the pH relatively constant, and as I've said many times, it's important to maintain a constant pH in the blood. In cerebrospinal fluid, there are no buffers. So, if you monitor the pH in the cerebrospinal fluid, you can get a good handle on what the state of CO2, PCO2 that is. And if you notice here, uh, the regions that are, that all of these regions here, these are the neural control mechanisms, but the chemical control mechanisms are along here too, and they're very close to the uh, cerebrospinal fluid in these uh, cavities here. This is the beginnings of the canal down the uh, spinal cord, and of course up here you open out into the brain ventricles, which are full of cerebrospinal fluid. So the chemical control uh, um, centers in the brain are close to the uh, cerebrospinal fluid, and I'll show you closer where they are here. So here they are looking from the uh, throat uh, backwards to the back of the brain, you can see here's the pons. You can see we're in the medulla again. And uh, there, there are two uh, regions of chemical um, uh, monitoring, chem chemosensitive areas on the ventral surface of the medulla, uh, the rostral regions, and the caudal regions. So rostral means closest to the head, caudal closest to the tail. So rostral, caudal, dorsal, ventral. And so the rostral regions here um, and the caudal regions here, and they are connected via uh, the uh, cranial nerves um, to the um, uh, rhythm, rhythm generators. And they probably monitor the pH of the cerebrospinal fluid. So again, uh, a little bit vague, these areas, you know, they're just, they're not well defined, and uh, these, these areas uh, are really still the, still the topic of, of study, and to define exactly, exactly where they are, and which neurons are involved. So that's the central chemoreceptors, chemoreceptor cells centrally. Uh, what about the ones in the circulation? We have 
uh, also um, chemosensitive cells in the circulation. So um, if you were going to put uh, chemosensitive cells in the circulation, what would be a good place to put them? Well, you'd want to know how much oxygen is getting to the brain. That's, that would be a prime uh, thing. And so uh, if oxygen doesn't get to the brain, you pass out. Uh, so how about putting some chemosensors in the main arteries uh, going up to the brain? Sure. And they're, they're there. And so uh, here is the, um, the carotid artery, the common carotid artery. And there, where the common carotid artery bifurcates into the internal and external carotid, there are regions of chemosensitive cells here. And these are called the carotid bodies. The carotid bodies. So that's good. They're in the circulation um, which is going to the brain. So you can immediately think, know where there's enough oxygen going to the brain. Where else would be a good place to put uh, chemosensitive cells? The brain's important. You know, what about the rest of the body? Well, how about putting them in one of the great vessels coming out of the heart going to the systemic circulation. Well, that's the aorta, isn't it? And sure enough, there are bodies in the aorta, not shown on this picture, I'll show you on the next one. There are bodies here in the aorta monitoring the uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide levels in the blood, leaving the heart, going to the rest of the circulation. So they're in the right place, these um, uh, chemosensitive cells. They're in the carotid bodies up here, and they're in the so-called aortic bodies here uh, on the aorta. And these send signals to the brainstem via the glossopharyngeal nerve, that's number nine, here from the carotid body, and the vagus nerve from the uh, aortic bodies. And I think the next picture shows you the aortic body. Yeah, here they are. So this is the same picture, uh, just shows you um, the aortic bodies as well as the, the carotid bodies. Here are the carotid bodies here in the bifurcation of the uh, carotid artery. And here, are, this is where the aortic bodies are here, connected by the vagus nerve uh, and the, um, the, uh, the carotid bodies are connected by the glossopharyngeal nerve. So the carotid bodies detect decreases in arterial P PO2 and send impulses to the medulla via the glossopharyngeal nerve. Uh, that's these ones up here. And the carotid bodies do the same with the vagus nerve. Now, we don't know a lot about these things. They're difficult to study. The aortic uh, bodies are particularly difficult to study because of where they are. Um, if you're going to do an experiment on, um, uh, on an animal, you've got to open up the chest and you've got to get in there and mess around with the aorta. Really difficult to do these experiments. Carotid body is much more easy. You can expose the carotid bodies and you can uh, manipulate them and see what the, what the uh, response of the animal is. So we know more about the carotid bodies than we do about the uh, aortic bodies. Uh, nevertheless, what we know about these things are pretty sketchy. Um, but, uh, but they are there, and uh, they signal to the uh, medulla. So they're signaling to the rhythm generator in the medulla, and again, are modifying, reinforcing the uh, respiratory rhythm. All fits together, you know, the multiple mechanisms. It's nice stuff. Are, are there any, any questions? How are you, how are you getting on here? I'm doing a lot of talking and not much going on over there, I think. Everything good? Good, good, good. So, okay, as I say, we don't know a lot about these things, but we can um, isolate them and cut a section of them and look at them. You know, here's a cartoon. Uh, it's not an actual micrograph. Uh, would be nice. I should probably find an actual micrograph and show uh, show what these things actually look like, rather than a cartoon. But uh, there you go. Um, here, um, here are the cell, a typical cell of the uh, carotid body called a type 
one cell, sometimes called a glomus cell, I don't know why. And these cells are sensitive to hypoxia, and they release catecholamines, which stimulate the ending of the axons of the uh, glossopharyngeal nerve. So here, they, here it is. Uh, here are the uh, vesicles containing the catecholamines, which stimulate the endings of the glossopharyngeal uh, afferents and send uh, uh, messages up to the medulla. And another one here, and they turn out to be surrounded by these type 2 cells, which are like glia. They're like nerve, uh, nurse cells, which secrete um, factors which keep the uh, important uh, type 1 cells uh, functioning and happy. So that's roughly what, what they look like. And people are still studying these because we really don't have a clue how they work particularly well. So that, that's a typical example of what it, what it looks like. And so if we can just put together in this sort of rather crude uh, diagram here of what I've said over the last sort of half hour or so, um, here are the various uh, sensory inputs which all work together. Uh, sensory inputs, there's the central chemoreceptors. Do you remember the central chemoreceptors in the brain that are sensing the cerebrospinal fluid? Uh, the peripheral chemoreceptors, the carotid body and the aortic bodies. Uh, the pulmonary stretch receptors, that's the Herring Brewer reflex also inputting into the, um, the pattern generator. Uh, irritant receptors in the throat, remember, if you're going to cough, uh, then that interrupts the, um, uh, the rhythm. So there are irritant receptors, um, proprioceptors. Do you remember what proprioceptors are? Hmm? I'm sorry? Pressure baroreceptors. Location. Position, yeah, that's right, yeah. Enables me to do this. There, first time. Both hands. So, proprioceptors know where your body parts are. And this is relevant to breathing because your breathing is different when you're lying down. You don't have to go there. But your breathing rate and depth is different when you're lying down from when you're standing up. So, there are proprioceptors which inform the brain what, what exactly position your, your body is in. So the proprioceptors also uh, have input. So that's the sensory input. Uh, then there are regions in the pons. Remember, there are, what was it, the pneumotaxic center and the apneustic center feeding in. And then there's voluntary control. So you can hold your breath or you can deliberately hyperventilate. You can override these systems as well. And these all feed into the central pattern generator in the medulla. Now, this diagram was drawn before uh, in pre-Botzinger days. So you could put a diagram, an arrow here and write the pre-Botzinger complex there uh, because that's what essentially is what it uh, is referring to. Um, and then uh, this affects the inspiratory uh, neurons, the uh, dorsal respiratory group, and the ventral respiratory group. That's what that, uh, that stands for in the medulla, and gives you a nice, smooth breathing rhythm that you don't even think about. Okay? Anything anyone wants to talk about? Because I'd like to talk a little bit more about the chemoreceptors, because we know a bit about those. So the chemoreceptors out there are sensing PO2 and PCO2, and as a result, sometimes pH as well. And counterintuitively, you know what that means? Not what you would think. Not what you would think. It turns out that the CO2 levels are more important than the oxygen levels. But wouldn't think that, would you? I'm not saying the oxygen importance aren't in, electron levels aren't important. They are. Hypoxia is a major stimulant to breathing. But the most sensitive turns out to be carbon dioxide. So look at these two diagrams here. 
This is the uh, ventilation rate here. This is arterial PO2. So here's the normal resting level of arterial PO2, 100 millimeters of mercury. As we drop this down from 100 to, ooh, 70, there's hardly any difference in the respiratory rate. Can you see that? If you go from, from 100 to 80, there's no difference at all. Very little difference here. And then once you get down uh, below 60, then, then you start breathing rapidly in response to hypoxia. But the initial response between 100 and 75 is very little response. If you compare that to the carbon dioxide curve, here is the ventilation rate. Here is the uh, normal arterial PCO2. If we raise the PCO2 even a little bit, look at the curve of respiration rate. The respiration rate immediately uh, begins to climb rapidly. So that says, this compared to this says that uh, the most immediate response to changes in blood chemistry are changes in response to the carbon dioxide level rather than the oxygen level. Yeah? So carbon dioxide, a rising carbon dioxide level gives you a much more immediate response in ventilation rate than a drop in oxygen level. Not what you would think. Quite a long time ago, I remember seeing a TV show run by um, a man called Jonathan Miller, who's a uh, a presenter, TV personality, um, actually worked with some very funny British um, comedians in the 1960s. But he was a doctor, and he was a presenter, and this is a great combination. Um, and he did a TV show called The Body in Question. And he, uh, one of the programs was addressing this issue. And he did an experiment live on the camera, which I've never seen done before, um, which was really cool. Let me see if I can explain it to you. It was cool at the time, you know, I, I suspect you're going to wonder why, because it'll lose something. But let me try anyway. So, so what happened was, they sat him down uh, on a chair and hooked him up to um, a tube, which enabled him to rebreathe the air that he, that he was breathing. In other words, a closed system. So you breathe in and out the air with the same air. Well, what's going to happen if you do that? If you're going to do that, the oxygen in the air that you breathe is